God, we, we thank you for your presence here with us this morning. We thank you for um, your word, and we just open up our hearts and our minds to you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would meet with us, that you would open up our understanding, um, anoint your word to us, speak to our hearts. Lord, I ask that you would bring encouragement, Lord, where encouragement is needed. Um, and Lord, that you would bless our ears as we hear your word this morning. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Thanks for being here this morning. How are you this morning? Doing good? Doing good? So last week, Jim brought a really awesome word on Abraham and God's promises to Abraham. And it's really hard to move beyond this point because Genesis 15, and I think Jim said this last week, it's really the hinge. Uh, it's really one of kind of the first big hinges, first big turning points in the whole story of God. And, and in these chapters in Genesis 15, 16, 17, and 18, there's lots of stories, individual kind of wild stories with a lot of information and detail that feels really foreign to you and I because the culture was so different and it was such a long time ago. Um, but there's these individual stories that we're leaning into and we're gonna, we're gonna move through stories about Isaac and Jacob and the other patriarchs and, and how they lived and the way that God interacted with them. Um, but before we get there, I'm gonna pull us back again to Genesis 15 and Abraham and some conversations that God had with Abraham and with Sarah. There's, there's individual life stories happening, but often as is true in scripture, there's a bigger narrative going on. And there's a story of God that's also happening. And I think it's really significant and helpful for us to understand that we're not just reading about Abraham and we're not just reading about God's promises to a man named Abraham and a, and a woman named Sarah, um, but he's also writing a larger story. There's a larger story, an eternal story, if you will, that God is uh, inviting us to take a look at. So we're going to do that this morning together. Um, when you read through the story of Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 15, and you can turn there with me, there's this wild encounter. Um, and as is common through a lot of stories in the Old Testament, there's things that God does and, uh, and actions that the people of God take that are so foreign to us because we don't live this way. It has been probably thousands of years since people have lived this way. And yet there's concepts and things that God is doing that very much have implication and affect who we are today. And there's things that are transpiring in these stories between Jehovah and individuals individual men and women that we are still a part of today. And one of those things is covenant. And covenant, it's not a common word, particularly in our Western culture anymore. I was trying to think of examples of covenant, and the only thing that I could think of was marriage. Um, and really, you, I think you get outside of church circles and Christian circles, or maybe even communities of faith, and marriage is really not even viewed as a covenant anymore. It, at best, it might be a strong promise that we make to one another. So the idea of covenant is really kind of lost to us, and it's, it's definitely in the way that God communicated and established covenant, it's very foreign to us today. But I think it's very significant that we take a few minutes to understand the imagery of it, and the significance of it because it empowers us to understand both our identity and our inheritance as people of God today. So Genesis chapter 15, uh, if you have the Bibles that have the little titles on the top of each chapter, the title over this chapter is The Lord's Covenant with Abram. And it's, it's kind of a wild, it's a wild chapter. And at the very beginning of it, uh, God and Abram are talking uh, in a vision and, and God comes to Abram and he says, don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is not even a son? He's like a relative. And Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside and said, look up and count the stars of the sky, if indeed you can. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. 
God also said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know? How can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. And the story goes on, Abram brought these animals to God and Abraham killed them and he cut them in half and he laid the halves open on the ground. And then Abram, the, the Bible says, Abram fell into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, God began to pass through the halves of the animals. And, and there was symbolism. He passed through what Abram saw was a smoking pot and a blazing torch, which were symbols and imagery of the presence of God there. And, and so Abram sees the smoking pot and torch passing between the halves of the, of the cut open animals. And, and as God's doing this, God's talking to Abraham and he's unpacking and prophesying not just more promises but about the future of the promises that God's given him and he's telling them this son is going to become a great nation and and he begins to talk to Abraham about the slavery that uh, his descendants will be in and then he says but never fear I will bring them out and so uh, so there's this whole wild wild interaction between God and Abram that is nothing like what we would have in our world and culture today. You know, when we, and again, thinking back to our wedding ceremonies, we're dressed in clothes that we love. And, um, you know, the messiest we might get would be when we spread that wedding cake all over our partner's face, you know, and the token or the sign and the symbol of our covenant uh, is not bloody animals cut in half, but it might be, you know, the exchange of a ring or the lighting of some candles or something like that. So this whole idea of covenant being established in this way is really, really wild and foreign to us. But it is something I think really significant and really powerful powerful to us. God initiates the covenant-making promise uh, process with Abram as a result of Abram's questions to God. This isn't the first time Abram has heard God say things and make promises to him. And you don't really get the sense, and maybe he was, but I don't, I don't necessarily get the sense that Abraham's doubting God when God comes again and says, you know, I am the God who brought you out of Ur, and I am the God who said I'm going to give you land. And I did tell you that I would make, uh, make your descendants uh, as numerous as the sands on on the ground and the stars and the sky. Abraham and God have had this conversation before. Um, and so Abram's more like revisiting it with God and asking God, okay, because it even says Abram believed. Abram believed what God was saying, but Abram's still kind of pointing out, like Jim said last week, pointing out the obstacles. There's still some problems here. I still don't have a son. And so why are we talking about inheritance when I don't even have anybody to pass it on to? You know, and how is this going to come about? And, and Abram asked Jehovah, how am I going to know? And, and Jehovah, not out of anger or, or doubt or criticism from Abraham, but just, I think, out of the very character and nature of who God is, God establishes a covenant with, with Abraham. Uh, a covenant is really significant because it is the revelation of God's purposes framed in definite promises. So covenant, if you're asking, well, what is a covenant? Covenant is the revelation in the Bible. What is biblical covenant? It is the revelation of God's purposes framed in definite promises so that we, you and I, who are participants in that covenant might know what to desire and what to expect. Um, and just, just for record's sake, that's not my wisdom. That is the wisdom of Andrew Murray, who does some phenomenal writing on covenant. But covenant, in essence, it's the security and guarantee that the promises of God will indeed be accomplished. So Abraham's kind of asking God, how am I going to know? And God goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a covenant with you. That word make actually translates cut. I'm going to cut a covenant with you, reflective of the cutting of the animals, so that you will know that it's not just my word, it's not just my promise, but we are in a, we are in a sacred and a powerful relationship with one another where my promise to you is guaranteed. It is held secure and it is guaranteed. Um, Blood covenant, and this is, what, this is what this particular covenant was, blood covenant involved the cutting of animals, 
and the people walking between the halves. And, and so they're all walking in and among the blood and the entrails of the animal. And it's known as cutting a covenant with someone. In ancient times, all the way up through, there's record of blood covenants happening through the 1800s in tribes in Africa. Blood covenant was one of the most sacred and significant acts that two parties could engage in. And it could be individuals, it could be tribes, it could be rulers, it could be nations. But it was a pledge for life unto death for the well-being and security of one another. So when, when somebody cut a covenant, when two parties cut a covenant with one another, the nature of that covenant, it wasn't just trading favors. It wasn't like I've got your back and you've got mine when we need it, but it was actually a pledge for the duration of our life unto death that might even cost me our life. It might cost me my, my life, but it is, it is a pledge guaranteeing that I will give everything I have towards your well-being and your security. And when we understand that that's what God was doing, it's as if in this moment of, in time, God is also revealing part of his heart to Abraham. He's saying, I'm not, it's, I'm not just giving you promises, but we're going to hit pause. I actually want to open up my heart to you. I want you to understand that I am giving my life to secure you and for your well-being. And I will give my life unto death for your security and your well-being. What's, what's stunning about this is that when you and I, in the time that we live in, look at that conversation, we understand that that is exactly what God did. You know, two, 3,000 years later, God, God fulfilled this covenant through Jesus. And God, God gave everything he had unto death. Jesus is part of the triune God. Gave, God gave himself unto death to secure our well-being. It's, it was a life pledge. And God, in essence, obligates himself to humanity at this point in time, which is huge. It's huge. I hear people say all the time, I don't want to be obligated to somebody, right? And yet God, God willingly, voluntarily, out of the fullness of his heart and character, obligates himself to humanity unto death to secure our well-being. It's, it's massive when we think about that. Um, Covenant, covenant, like I said, and this was just an interesting fact, it was such a sacred and powerful act. There's two really well-known uh, men that actually witnessed this all the way up to the 1800s. So culturally, I, culturally, I think it's important for us to understand the weight that covenant carried, that, that all the way back in, in ancient, ancient times, it had such a weight and a gravity to it that it carried all the way through like the 1800s. And there were tribes in Africa that um, so Sir Henry Stanley, he was a Welsh reporter who was looking for the missionary David Livingston in Africa who had gone missing. And they end up finding each other. And both these men report participating in and witnessing blood covenant. Um, and, it, and they said it was such a sacred and powerful act. It was never broken. When tribes or rulers made it with one another, it was never broken. It was not just trading favors. And, and it was something that they would respect even to like the third and fourth generation. So if I cut a covenant with a ruler when I died, that covenant often had lasting, lasting implications for like three and four generations. But, but I think it's important for us just to, just to get a glimpse of that because it had such a weight to it that the weight of that ceremony and the weight of that action carried all those years into like the 1800s. So that was such a part of, part of what covenant was. Uh, important to our conversation about covenant this morning is this. Other common practices, even in ancient times for blood covenant involved like um, cutting your wrist or cutting your stomach, cutting your forehead or your cheek, both parties would do that and they would mingle their blood. And often, and I'm sorry if this gets gory, but it does get fascinating. Often what they would do is they would drip their blood in a mutual cup of wine and then they would drink that wine. So think about that for a minute with me uh, in terms of what we do with the Lord's Supper and communion. Communion. 
You know, again, something that can feel a bit like a dry traditional church act. And again, some of the symbolism can be lost on us. But when Jesus, in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus talks to his disciples, it's on the eve of his death. And he says, Jesus took the bread, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken, cut for you. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. So that even as we often take communion, we do it in remembrance of God's sacrifice to us, but it calls us to a bigger understanding that he also has established a covenant with us and that he cut a covenant with us. And that when we, when we eat his broken, when we eat the bread and it's symbolism of his broken, pierced body and we drink the wine, it's a symbolism of his blood covenant with us. Jesus established a new covenant with us. And we as followers of Jesus in this day and age, we are a people of covenant, not just a people belonging to family, but a people of covenant with the new covenant. And that's what, that's what we call this new covenant that Jesus established with us. With the new covenant, God proves what he can do with man as unfaithful and feeble we are when God is allowed and trusted to do all the work that God has promised. So part of what happens in this new covenant was that, was that God, God took what he promised to Abraham and, and, and in the very essence and the very spirit of covenant, which was to secure your well-being for as long as we live, even unto my death, that, God, that sense of that covenant with Abraham carries through to the new covenant that God made with you and I, that Jesus made with you and I. But, but because of the nature of covenant too, because covenant also and always reveals the heart and purposes of God, uh, we understand that again in the establishing of the new covenant, it, it wasn't just that God wanted to bless offspring, but God's revelation of himself was through family and through, through generations. And, and in the old covenant that God established with Abram, part of this, the bigger story that's happening here is in covenant, there's blessing released to Abram and the blessing was for descendants and for offspring. And maybe God shared this with Abram and maybe he didn't, but we know that out of the family and the lineage of Abram came Jesus. And so even all the way back in ancient time in this covenant with Abram, what God is doing, God is setting the stage for the new covenant. God's setting the stage for the redemption and the restoration of humanity to himself. From the time of the fall in Eden, God's heart was to restore the broken connection between humanity and himself. And so Genesis 15 in the Abrahamic covenant is significant in this because it's God beginning to actually put into motion the steps for that to happen. And we see it played out all the way through the, the death, the life, and the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus was the fulfillment of that Abraham and Jehovah. Jehovah says to Abraham, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And, and the, the, the realization of that was in Jesus. Through Jesus, all the nations of the world will be blessed and drawn back to the Father himself. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. So powerful. Uh, covenant, I think, is significant to us today uh, for all of those reasons. But there's a couple things I wanted to just, uh, I think, pull down and make really personal for us today. When I was reading and reflecting on covenant, I was realizing that covenant is what brings us into union with God's heart and God's purposes. And Jim touched on this a little bit last week in, in his uh, message about um, promises, that when we live in promises and we're willing to dream with God, it pulls us into the purposes of God. And covenant does that same thing because the purpose of covenant always is to release blessing. Andrew Murray writes that, that the purpose of God's covenant with you and I is to put us in a place of utter dependence on him so that he can pour out blessing on us. And as he pours out that blessing, he's always writing a bigger story. And you and I know that we're part of the bigger 
bigger story of God. We're part of God's redemption on planet earth. We're part of furthering his kingdom. And he does that through you and I, but he blesses us and empowers us and equips us to do that. And so when we walk in covenant, covenant and we recognize that we're wrapped in covenant, it actually binds us to him. It puts us in union with him. I love, there's this glimpse when you go back to the story of Abraham, a couple chapters later, uh, you, have to, you have to read through this story where um, it's right before God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. So go back through and read it. But there's a couple verses in there where God and Abraham have been talking and God, you get, it's one of the few times in scripture you actually hear God talking to himself. <laughs> and God says, should I tell Abraham what I'm thinking about doing to Sodom? And he says, and it's after God's made this covenant with Abraham. And you get this sense that out of uh, respect and out of acknowledgement for the, the growing friendship and union and connection between Abraham and, and God, God is thinking to himself, do I pull Abraham into my plan? Do I pull him into my concern? Do I pull him into what I'm thinking? And God decides to do that. And he and Abraham have a conversation and Abraham actually pushes back with God and says, are you really going to do this? Are you, is this really your character? Are you really going to destroy everybody? What if God, there's 40 holy righteous people in the city, will you still destroy the city? And there's kind of this, what looks like a negotiation, but it's really a conversation between two men who share and know one another's heart. And so when we live and when we walk and when we're in covenant with God, it brings us into that place where we have even the right to push back at God a bit and go, do you really want to do this? Is this really your heart? Is this really the best course of action? And we get to have that place of dialogue with God, which is just significant and powerful. And, and, and what you see, even in that interaction between God and Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah is this, Abraham becomes a mediator for the people, the righteous people in that city. What happens all these thousands of years later we read in scripture that Jesus is the mediator between you and I. And you and I become mediators of the covenant of God here on earth. We get to, we're not really mediators, but we get to intercede on behalf of people. And we get to step in the gaps with people. We get to step into the conversation with God and go, God, let's have conversation together. If we talk about this person, what is your heart for this person? It's significant and it's powerful. Covenant calls us to faith. Uh, covenant really does ask us for some wild faith. Uh, we, we have a choice. We have a choice to enter into covenant or not, just like we have a choice to get married or not. You know, we have a choice to enter into covenant, but that choice must be wrapped and covered in faith. Like Abraham and Sarah, God's promises to Abraham and Sarah were about things they had never seen and that at that stage of their life began to feel really impossible. You know, Sarah was like, I'm old. I'm old and way past childbearing years and you're gonna birth a son through me and nations through me? Like, how's that gonna happen? You know, Sarah got a kick out of it. You know, scripture says she laughed. It was really kind of entertaining to her to think about the notion of God doing that. And then it, when God gave that promise to Abraham, it was years before the fulfillment of that promise. But it said that Abraham still, and we know Abraham blew it a bit. He deviated a bit. That's where Hagar and Ishmael come into the story. But, but Abraham didn't take the promise of God and just stick it up on a shelf. That word believe means he stewarded it, he nurtured it, he nursed it, like it was an ever-present part of, the, of, the, of, the, of his life. And so covenant with God, it calls us to a place of faith where we are wholeheartedly giving ourselves to the promises of God. We're nursing them and we're nourishing them and we're stewarding them. We're paying attention to them. Covenant renders us, I love this quote by Andrew Murray, covenant renders us entirely dependent on God to bring us into the right position and disposition in which he can fill us with himself, his love, and his presence. Ephesians 3, I want to I turn there real quick. Ephesians 3 says this, Paul is writing to the Ephesians and he says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. 
I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Covenant puts us in union with God. It requires faith with us. But out of covenant, family is also birthed. Out of covenant, family is also birthed and born. Family birthed from covenant is what we find in the old covenant between Abraham and Sarah and God. Literally, I'm going to give you a son. And it's also birthed out of the new covenant with Jesus. We are, we are given a new birth, scripture says. We are born into Christ and we are born into his family. Paul writes over and over again about how we are adopted into the family of God. We are joint heirs with the family of God. But covenant family is born from covenant. Covenant is the thing that holds us together and binds us when everything is blowing apart. And I think this is really important for our stirring community because we value family. We talk about family. We, we call, we, we use language that says we're calling sons and daughters home and we're stirring family. And family is significant and it's important and it's powerful, but man, it's broken and it's dysfunctional. And most of us don't have phenomenal experiences of family. And so what holds us even in the bigger context of that whole conversation is covenant. Covenant is covenant because God has, God has obligated himself to you and I. For all eternity, he has obligated himself to you and I he, so that all of the promises in scripture that he has spoken to you and I are held secure and guaranteed to us by him, in him, and through him. And so covenant is what binds us together and binds us to him even when family, which is God's heart and expression and the way that he wants to reveal himself to the world around us, even when that blows apart, the thing that still holds this all together is covenant. And for many of us, our history and experience with father and mother is so broken and we struggle to believe in the idea of family or to belong to family because our experience is our strongest teacher. And it's the loudest voice that we live by. We often live by the wisdom of our experience and the proof of how life actually is. But covenant calls us to step outside of our experience into that place of faith where what is promised is still unseen, but it's possible. And that's what covenant does. So when we invite people into family and when we call them into family and when we come into the family of God through faith and through salvation, we are also becoming not just sons and daughters, but we are a covenant of people that belong to a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. And he does call us to let go of our experiences and to hold on to that which we cannot see and seems impossible because he has guaranteed and promised it through himself. K. Arthur says this, covenant brings us into an invisible oneness with God. It is the guarantee of our belonging, of never being forsaken and of never being alone. To understand covenant is to hear God say, you are precious in my sight and to believe him. So this morning, as we close, my prayer for you and the invitation that I sense God uh, inviting us into this morning is just a place of consideration that, that, that if you follow Jesus, you're not only a son of God or a daughter of God, but you belong to covenant and covenant belongs to you. And there's a place in there where God may be asking you to reach for the thing that is promised but unseen that goes against the very grain of your experience because it's the thing that he wants to bind you in with him. It's the thing that he wants to bring you into and then release through you to the world around you. So Father, as we close, God, we surrender ourselves to you. God, we recognize that you have obligated yourself to us in a significant and in a powerful way. You have obligated yourself. You have bent yourself and you have bound yourself to us for all time. And Lord, we stand in awe of that this morning.
And I pray, God, that you would begin to knit into the fabric of our life with you the security that is that comes from that. It's beyond our experience. It's even beyond what we could imagine perfect family being. It's just already there. There's a guarantee and a sense of security that is found in you because of who you are and because of the covenant you made with us. And that covenant reflects your character and your nature so beautifully. So God, give us grace to lay hold of it. Give us grace to be like Abraham and Sarah who believed and judged you capable of fulfilling that which you promised. In your name, Jesus, we pray, amen.